our mysterious existence is the universe a conscious mind well let's remember that uh, space math scientists have confirmed that prayers actually do have an effect on solar storms our earth and the universe so what's going on here philip golf of Ian reports in the past 40 or so years a strange fact about our universe gradually made itself known to scientists the laws of physics and the initial conditions of our universe are fine-tuned for the possibility of life and it turns out for life to be possible the numbers in basic physics for example the strength of gravity or the mass of the electron must have values falling in a certain range and that range is an incredibly narrow slice of all the possible values those numbers can have it's therefore incredibly unlikely that a universe like ours would have the kind of numbers compatible with the existence of life but against all the odds our universe does and here are a few examples of this fine-tuning for life the strong nuclear force the force that binds together the elements in the nucleus of an atom has a value of 0 0.007 if that value felt the value had been 0 0.06 or less the universe would have contained nothing but hydrogen if it had been 0 0.008 or higher the hydrogen would have fused to make heavier elements in either case any kind of chemical complexity would have been physically impossible and without chemical complexity complexity there can be no life the physical possibility of chemical complexity is also dependent on the masses of the basic components of matter electrons and quarks if the mass of a down quark had been greater by a factor of three the universe would have contained only hydrogen if the mass of an electron had been greater by a factor of 2.5 the universe would have contained only neutrons no atoms at all and certainly no chemical reactions gravity seems a momentous force but it's actually much weaker than the other forces that affect atoms by about 1036 if gravity had been only slightly stronger stars would have formed from smaller amounts of material and consequently would have been smaller with much shorter lives a typical sun would have lasted around 10,000 years rather than 10 billion years not allowing enough time for the evolutionary processes that produce complex life conversely if gravity had been only slightly weaker stars would have been much colder and hence would not have exploded into supernova this also would have rendered life impossible as supernova are the main source of many of the heavy metals elements that form the ingredients of life some take the fine-tuning to be simply a basic fact about our universe fortunate perhaps but not something requiring explanation but like many scientists and philosophers i find this implausible in the life of the cosmos written in 1999 the physicist lee smolin has estimated that taking into account all of the fine-tuning examples considered the chance of life existing in the universe is one in 10,229 from which he concludes this in my opinion a probability this tiny is not something we can let go unexplained luck will certainly not do that do here we need some rational explanation of how something this unlikely turned out to be the case the two standard explanations of the fine-tuning are theism and the multiverse hypothesis theism postulates an all-powerful and perfectly good supernatural creator of the universe that is god and then explain the fine-tuning in terms of the good intentions of this creator life is something of great objective value god in his goodness wanted to bring about this great value and hence created laws with constant compatible constants compatible with its physical possibility the multiverse hypothesis postulates an enormous perhaps infinite number of physical universes other than our own in which many different values of the constants are released are realized and given a sufficient number of universes realizing a sufficient range of the constants it's not so improbable that there will be at least one universe with fine-tuned laws both of these theories are able to explain the fine-tuning 
The problem is that on the face of it, they also make false predictions. For the theist, the false prediction arises from the problem of evil. If one were told that a, great, a given universe was created by an all-loving, all-knowing, and all-powerful being, one would not expect the universe to contain enormous amounts of gratuitous suffering. One might not be surprised to find it contained intelligent life, but one would be surprised to learn that life had come about through the gruesome process of natural selection. Why would a loving God, who could do absolutely anything, choose to create life that way? Prima facie theists predicts a universe that is much better than our own, and because of this, the flaws of our universe count strongly against the existence of God. Turning to the multiverse hypothesis, the false prediction arises from the so-called Boltzmann brain problem, named after the 19th century Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann, who first formulated the paradox of the observed universe. Assuming there is a multiverse, you would expect our universe to be a fairly typical number of the universe ensemble, or at least a fairly typical number of the universes contained obser containing observers, since we could not find ourselves in a universe in which observers are impossible. However, The Road to Reality, written in 2004, the physicist and mathematician Roger Penrose has calculated that in the kind of multiverse most favored by contemporary physicists, based on inflationary cosmology and string theory, for every observer who observes a smooth, orderly universe as big as ours, there are 10 to the power of 10,123 who observe a smooth, orderly universe in just 10 times smaller. And by far, the most common kind of observer would be a Boltzmann brain, a functioning brain that has, by sheer fluke, emerged from a disordered universe for a brief, per brief period of time. If Penrose is right, then the odds of an observer in the multiverse theory finds itself in a large, ordered universe are astronomically small. And hence, the fact that we are ourselves such observers is powerful evidence against the multiverse theory. Neither of these are knockdown arguments. Theists can try to come up with reasons why God would allow the suffering we find in the universe, and multiverse theorists can try to fine-tune their theory, such as that our universe is less unlikely. However, both of these moves feel ad hoc, fiddling to try to save the theory rather than accepting that, on its most natural interpretation, the theory is falsified, I think we can do better. In the public mind, physics is on its way to giving us a complete account of the nature of space, time, and matter. We are not there yet, of course, for one thing. Our best theory of the very big general relativity is inconsistent with our best theory of the very small quantum physics, quantum mechanics. But it's standardly assumed that one day these challenges will be overcome and physicists will proudly present an eager public with the grand unified theory of everything, a complete story of the fundamental nature of the universe. In fact, for all its virtues, physics tells us precisely nothing about the nature of the physical universe. Consider Isaac Newton's theory of gravitation, universal gravitation. The variables of uh, m1 and m2, his um, formula was f equals g m1 m2 divided by r2. The variables m1 and m2 stand for the masses of two objects that we want to work out the gravitational attraction between. f is the gravitational attraction between those two masses. g is a gravitational constant, a number we know from observation. And r is the distance between m1 and m2. Notice that this equation does not provide us with definitions of what mass, force, and distance are. And this is not something peculiar to Newton's law. The subject matter of physics are the basic properties of the physics world, mass, charge, spin, distance, force. But the equations of physics do not explain what these properties are. They simply name them in order to assert equations between them. If physics is not telling us the nature of physical properties, what is it telling us? The truth is that physics is a tool for prediction. Even if, even if we don't know what mass and force really are, we're able to recognize them in the world. They show up as readings in our instruments or otherwise impact on our senses. And by using the equations of physics, such as Newton's law of gravity, 
we can predict what's going to happen with great precision. It's this predictive capacity that has enabled us to manipulate the natural world in extraordinary ways, leading to the technological revolution that has transformed our planet. We are now living through a period of history in which people are so blown away by the success of physical science, so moved by the wonders of technology, that they feel strongly inclined to think that the mathematical models of physics capture the whole of reality. But this is simply not the job of physics. Physics is the business of predicting the behavior of matter, not revealing its intrinsic nature. Given that physics tells us nothing of the nature of physical reality, is there anything we do know? Are there any clues as to what is going on under the bonnet of the engine of the universe? The English astronomer Arthur Eddington was the first scientist to confirm general relativity and also to formulate the Boltzmann brain problem discussed above, albeit in a different context. Reflecting on the limitations of physics in the nature of the physical world, written in 1928, Eddington argued that the only thing we really know about the nature of matter is that some of it has consciousness. We know this because we directly we are directly aware of the consciousness of our own brains. We are acquainted with an external world because its fibers run into our own consciousness. It is only our own ends of the fibers that we actually know. From these ends, we more or less successfully construct the rest as a paleontologist reconstructs the extinct monster from its footprints. We have no direct access to the nature of matter outside our brains, but the most reasonable speculation, according to Eddington, is that the nature of matter outside of brains is continuous with the nature of matter inside of brains. Given that we have no direct insight into the nature of atoms, it is rather silly, argued Eddington, to declare that atoms have a na nature entirely removed from mentality, and then to wonder where mentality comes from. In my book, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality, written in 2017, I developed these considerations into an extensive argument for panpsychism, the view that all matter has a, con a con consciousness involving nature. There are two ways of developing the basic panpsychic position. One is micropsychism, the view that the smallest parts of the physical world have consciousness. Micropsychism is not to be equated with the absurd view that quarks have emotions or that electrons feel existential angst. In human beings, consciousness is a sophisticated thing involving subtle and complex emotions, thoughts, and sensory experiences. But there seems nothing incoherent with the idea that consciousness might exist in some extremely basic forms. We have good reason to think that the consciousness experience of a horse is much less complex than that of a human being, and the experiences of a chicken less complex than those of a horse. As organisms become simpler, perhaps at some point, the light of consciousness suddenly switches off, with simpler organisms having no experience at all. But it's also possible that the light of consciousness never switches off entirely, but rather fades as organic complexity reduces through flies, insects, plants, amoeba, and bacteria. For the micropsychists, this fading while never turning off continuing, continuum further extends into inorganic matter with fundamental physical entities, perhaps electrons and quarks, possessing extremely rudimentary forms of consciousness to reflect their extremely simple nature. However, a number of scientists and philosophers of science have recently argued that this kind of bottom-up picture of the universe is outdated and that contemporary physics suggests that, in fact, we live in a top-down or holist universe in which complex wholes are more fundamental than their parts. According to holism, the table in front of you does not derive its existence from subatomic particles that compose it. Rather, those subatomic particles derive their existence from the table. Ultimately, everything that exists derives its existence from the ultimate complex system, the universe as a whole. Holism has a somewhat mystical association in its commitment to a single unified whole being, the ultimate reality. But there is strong scientific arguments in its favor. The American philosopher Jonathan Schaefer argues that the phenomenon of quantum entanglement is good evidence for 
holism. Entangled particles behave as a whole even if they are separated by such large distances that it is impossible for any kind of signal to travel between them. According to Schaefer, we can make sense of this only if, in general, we are in a universe in which complex systems are more fundamental than their parts. If we combine holism with panpsychism, we get cosmopsychism, the view that the universe is conscious and that the consciousness of humans and animals is derived not from the consciousness of fundamental particles, but from the consciousness of the universe itself. This is the view I ultimately defend in Consciousness and Fundamental Reality. The cosmopsychist need not think of the conscious universe as having human-like mental features, such as thought and rationality. Indeed, in my book, I suggest that we think of the cosmic consciousness as a kind of mess, devoid of intellect or reason. However, it now seems to me that reflection on the fine-tuning might give us grounds for thinking that the mental life of the universe is just a little closer than I had previously thought to the mental life of a human being. The Canadian philosopher John Leslie proposed an intriguing explanation of fine-tuning, which in Universe, written in 1989, he called achiarchism. What strikes us so incredible about the fine-tuning is that of all the values of constants in our laws, had, they ended up having exactly those values required for something of great value, which is life, and ultimately intelligent life. If the laws had not, against huge odds, been fine-tuned, the universe would have had infinitely less value. Some say it would have had no value at all. Leslie proposes that this proper understanding of the problem points us to the direction of the best solution. The laws are fine-tuned because their being so leads to something of great value. Leslie is not imagining a deity mediating between the facts of value and the cosmological facts. The facts of value, as it were, reach out and fix the values directly. It can hardly be denied that archaearchism is a parsimonious explanation of fine-tuning as it posits no entities whatsoever other than the observable universe but it's not clear that it is intelligible. intelligible. Values don't seem to be the right kind of thing to have a causal influence on the workings of the world, at least not independently of the motives of rational agents. It's rather like suggesting that the abstract number nine caused a hurricane. But the cosmopsychist is a, a way of uh, rendering archaearchism intelligible by proposing that the mental cap capacities of the universe mediate between the value facts and cosmological facts. On this view, which we can call agentive cosmopsychism, the universe itself fine-tuned the laws in response to the considerations of values. When was this done? In the first 10 to 43 seconds, known as the Planck epoch, our current physical theories in which the fine-tuned laws are embedded break down. The cosmopsychist can propose that during this early stage of cosmological history, the universe itself chose the fine-tuned values in order to make possible the universe of value. Making sense of this requires two modifications to basic cosmopsychism. Firstly, we need to suppose that the universe acts through a basic capacity to recognize and respond to considerations of value. This is very different from how we normally think about things but it is consistent with everything we observe. The Scottish philosopher David Hume long ago noted that we can all really observe, all we can really observe is how things behave. The underlying forces that give rise to those behaviors are invisible to us. We standardly assume that the universe is powered by a number of non-rational causal capacities, but it's also possible that it's powered by the capacity of the universe to respond to considerations of value. How are we to think about the laws of physics on this view? I suggest that we think of them as constraints on the agency of the universe. Unlike the god of theism, this is an agent of limited power, which explains the manifest imperfections of the universe. The universe acts to maximize value, but is able to do so only within the constraints of the laws of physics. The, benefic the beneficence of the universe does not much reveal itself these days, 
the adjective cosmopsychist might explain that by holding that the universe is now more constrained than it was in the unique circumstance of the first split second after the Big Bang, when currently known laws of physics did not apply. Occam's razor is the principle that all things being equal, more parsimonious theories, that is to say theories with relatively few postulations, are to be preferred. Is it not a great cost in terms of parsimony to ascribe fundamental consciousness to the universe? Not at all. The physical world must have some nature. The physics and physics leaves us completely in the dark as what it is. It's no less parsimonious to suppose that the universe has a consciousness involving nature than that it has some non-conscious involving nature. If anything, the former proposal is more parsimonious insofar as it continues with the only thing we really know about the nature of matter, that brains have consciousness. Having said that, the second and final modification we must make to cosmopsychism in order to explain the fine-tuning does come at some cost. If the universe, way back in the Planck epoch, fine-tuned the laws to bring about life billions of years in this future, then the universe must in some way be aware of the consequences of its actions. This is the second modification. I suggest that the agentive cosmopsychist postulate a basic disposition of the universe to represent the complete potential consequence of each of its possible actions. In a sense, it's a simple postulation, but it cannot be denied that the complexity involved in this mental representation distracts from the parsimony of the view. However, this commitment is arguably less profig profligate than the postulations of the theist or the multiverse theory. The theist postulates a supernatural agent, that is God, while the agentive cosmopsychist postulates a natural agent. The multiverse theorist postulates an enormous number of distinct, unobservable entities, the many universes. The agentive cosmopsychist merely adds an an entity and we really, uh, that we really believe in, the physical universe. And most importantly, adjunctive cosmopsychic avoids the false predictions of its two rivals. The idea that the universe is a conscious mind that responds to value strikes us as ludicrously extravagant cartoon, but we must judge the view not on its cultural associations, but on its explanatory power. Agentive cosmopsychic explains the fine-tuning without making false predictions, and it does so with a simplicity and elegance unmatched by its rivals. It is a view we should take seriously. This essay was made possible through the support of grant from Templeton Religious Trust to Aeon and a separate grant from the Templeton-funded Pantheism and Pantheism Project to the author. The opinions expressed in the publications those of the authors do not necessarily reflect the views of Templeton Religious Trust. And this is by Philip Goff, Associate Professor in Philosophy at the Central European University in Budapest. His research interest is in consciousness and he blogs at conscious and consciousness and this is on bended reality so it seems that something from the beginning created everything just right to have the universe uh, created for value and that everything was fine-tuned just to have life and uh, to me that's of course the divine our divine triune god this is Unbended Reality. Please leave your comments. Thank you for your support. Please support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily, and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.